Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't be here for the morning session. Uh, bloody Southern Rail is, is uh, uh, the, the reason. Uh, I was really pleased to get this great title, Ethics of Surveillance, Power and Citizenship. So, so I said, that's fine, that's great. You're going to give me six hours to talk about that. And they said, no, no, 20 minutes. Oh, oh right, OK. So uh, uh, what I'm going to focus on in particular is I think there's a... Uh, it's kind of political talk, really. I, I, I want to. I, th I think there's a, a human dignity-shaped hole in the middle of the, the the big data AI machine learning paradigm, and I'm going to. That's what I'm going to explore today. Um, I'm going to start off with. Um, I'm going to talk about what the world of data mining is not. And I think this is one of the most uh, misused words of the English language. Perhaps the most misused words of the English language, Orwellian. Uh, well, refute is actually the most misused word in the English language, but Orwellian is the second most. I've got uh, George here on my T-shirt uh, to prove it. And I think it's just the wrong picture. I don't think um, data mining is an Orwellian world, but it's quite interesting to explore why it isn't, because uh, that gives us some interesting insights into what the, what the interesting ethical issues are uh, with respect to uh, data mining and surveillance and uh, that kind of thing. So... What is the Orwellian world? It's this. So we've talked about the Bentham Orwell model. So as Winston Smith and, and, and uh, uh, having a rotten time with Big Brother in 1984, uh, his, his idea of surveillance is actually exactly the same as Jeremy Bentham's, uh, who uh, invented the, uh, or designed uh, a prison called the Panopticon where everyone was visible all the time. And I think it's interesting to explore what the principles of this model are because we can see what the contrasts are with this model, the Bentham Orwell model, and data mining uh, as carried out today. So uh, that would be my starting point. So my claim is that the Bentham Orwell model has basically five principles. So the first principle is a metaphysical one. We're always visible, right? In 1984, Winston Smith is always visible. There's an empirical principle which says we're not always being watched. And this is set out quite early on in 1984, I think in the first chapter, that uh, Winston is not always under surveillance. He's visible but not being watched. But there's an epistemological principle that at any particular time he doesn't know whether he's being watched or not. Right? So he may or may not be being watched. He doesn't know. And that's, that's where his dilemmas come from. There's an institutional principle, which is basically that underpinning the, 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 the system of surveillance, there's this incredibly violent uh, regime of, of punishment and constraint. So if you're caught doing something wrong, it's really serious. Right? So there's this uh, terrible institutional principle. So why did Orwell and Bentham dream up something based on those principles? Well. There's a teleological principle. What's the purpose of the model? The purpose of the model is to allow human surveillance to scale. So if you want to have people in whatever, uh, in, a, in, a, in a nation, let's say, under surveillance 24-7, right, you actually need, uh, on, on, assuming the snoopers have an eight-hour uh, um, shift, you need 75% of the population to observe the other 25% of the population. It's not going to scale. So actually, if people self-censor because of all the, uh, the fact that they may be being watched, and it's very serious if they're caught being watched, then human surveillance can scale. And I don't know whether Orwell had read Bentham. I think it's just two great minds having the same solution to the same problem of how do we get uh, human surveillance to scale. So then the question is, is that 1984 world, is that like the world we have today? And I think the answer is no. When we look at those five principles, and compare them with uh, surveillance in, in, in uh, 2018, they're not, they're not always uh, only the first one. So we're always visible because we carry around our smartphones and our, our, our whatever. So we are visible to everyone. But whereas Winston Smith was not always being watched in 1984, nowadays we are always being watched. Right? Everything we do is being blocked. So it's a much more thoroughgoing uh, type of surveillance. Uh, Winston had an epistemological problem. He didn't know when he was being watched. We don't have that same epistemological, uh, epistemological problem. We've been watched all the time. 
So at any time, T, we know that we're being watched. We might, there are some people in the world who are unaware of this, but it, it's not a secret. Uh, we might not know what's happening to our data and who's getting it, but equally, uh, we know that someone is doing something with, with whatever data we're generating, and we're generating it all the time. With respect to the institutional violence, there's this great, uh, rather disturbing quote from 1984. You know, if you want a vision of the future, imagine your boots stamping on a human face forever. Right? Very disturbing, very horrible thing. The Facebook world, if you want a vision of the future, imagine receiving mildly irritating advertisements all the time forever. <laughs> it's not quite as big a deal. We have to say that. It's not, it's not as, uh, 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 as harmful. And whereas 1984, I mean, Orwell anticipated automatic writing. He did not anticipate automatic reading of the data. So all the surveillance was human, whereas actually very little of the surveillance we go through today is human. So the world of data mining today is not very like uh, the Orwellian world. It's more like this. It's more like a mountain of sugar. It's very difficult to get around, but it's tasty and it's rather tempting. And in fact, Zuckerberg is German for sugar mountain, which I find quite sinister. <laughs> so, <clears throat> from this picture, I think there's kind of three ethical things that, that follow that I'd like to just emphasize. The first is, it's not about coercion. That's the point. Whereas 1984 was all about coercion, this, you know, data, the data mining world, AI, machine learning, is not about coercion. And these are the ethical things that count. Uh, transparency, uh, consent, autonomy. I'm particularly interested by the idea of exit. Do, do we, are we able to leave this world? Are we able to refuse uh, to be part of this Twitter, Facebook world that Susan and Les were just describing? Uh, I think it's a kind of interesting moot point and, and, and a tricky one. The second, if you think about privacy, all surveillance is a breach of privacy. Right? It may be justified, but, it, but, there, but all surveillance is a privacy breach by definition. Uh, it's, it's remarkable how many theories of privacy do not uh, deliver that as, as a theorem. And when we think about the world of modernity, which uh, Orwell was talking about, individuality is an important thing when, when Orwell was writing. It was a key value of modernity. And it was generally expressed through choice. You, you chose what goods you were going to consume in a, in a free market. You chose your uh, leaders via uh, some democratic system. Uh, you, you would choose where to live. You would choose your friends uh, in ways that weren't true in pre-modern days. So privacy was an important value in modernity because you needed privacy to make those choices, make them authentically. And so surveillance comes in in 1984 where privacy is to be expected into Winston's own home. Uh, and so the ethics of 1984 are completely straightforward. You can't read 1984 without realising it's an ethically very degenerate place. Now, when we think about digital modernity, the world of today, uh, individuality is still a key value, but it's expressed in a different way. It's not expressed through choice. It's expressed through personalisation. So the model that, of, of modernity that Orwell was working with was the world comes at you, and you choose the bits of it that you are interested in. Whereas now, uh, the, the model is much more like, we will personalize the world to your requirements. But the thing is, personalization precludes privacy. If I'm providing you a personalized service, I've got to know quite a lot about you. So the ethics of this uh, non-Orwellian surveillance are much less straightforward, because Privacy, uh, it's going to be inimical to privacy uh, in, in that way. And the third thing I want to emphasize, it's just big data is very consequentialist. Right? A good thing to do with big data is something that has good consequences. And that's because it's all about large populations and general probabilities, statistics, predictions, uh, based on uh, analysis of very large quantities of data. And so there's, there's an automatic tendency to think in consequentialist terms, utilitarianism, you know, what's the, what's the greatest happiness of the greatest number, that kind of principle. But the problem is that big data then becomes self-evaluative because, you know, you say, right, I've done some of my big data analysis and I think we should do this intervention. And then your ethicist says, is that a good intervention? What are the consequences of doing this? And you say, right, okay, I've done my big data analysis and the consequences are good. 
So it, 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 it evaluates uh, and, and gives itself, uh, it ticks its own box, if you like. So I think this plays out in a number of contexts. Let's think about, uh, I'm kind of hoping I'm not running out of time. Um, three, three particular ones, business, academe, and uh, governance, public service. Um, the issue with businesses, so the driver here is, is the exchange. Data becomes part of an exchange between a consumer and a company. And you know, the way free markets kind of justify themselves is that the exchange is a win-win. That's, that's, the, that's the, 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 the good thing about them. The problem is with uh, uh, the, the kind of dealing with business in terms of data is that the, the terms of the exchange are hidden. We don't know quite what the business gains, and I'm giving away a lot of my personal data or a lot of my privacy, and I don't know what the cost of that is to me. That, that's quite hard to work out, and that's just a problem with that kind of area. And this is where a lot of the ethical issues uh, arise with, with business. With academe, where the driver is curiosity, although uh, increasingly it's within applied context, data subjects are curiously kind of um, disconnected. Uh, I mean, sometimes they, they, they can sign consent forms. But, I mean, Susan was describing the, the, the work done on Twitter data. What a weird kind of relationship you have as, as someone who's tweeted about Portsmouth to find yourself being the study of some, uh, involved in some study about whether Southampton is happier than Portsmouth, uh, which it clearly should be, even if it isn't. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's a kind of weird relationship. And uh, if people want to pull out of that, is that kind of framed as progressive academics uh, being held back by Luddite people who don't want to be involved in the research. Um, I, mean, I think Brexit and, the, uh, and Donald Trump kind of show that the exam passing classes are not always very good at understanding the rest of the world. That might not be a very good conversation to have. And then the third uh, area where the, eth where the ethical uh, relationships are rather different again is public service, where the driver is the public good. But then there's a question, well, who's defining the public good? Who's detecting that in the data? What are the parameters of, uh, for, public, for, for, for uh, goodness of a public outcome? Who's defining that? The citizen has a bit of a voice because the citizen can vote, uh, but you're denied exit because the state is, is, uh, has the legitimacy to do whatever it likes uh, within, within the limits of the constitutions. And it's interesting how uh, Ian Hacking's very good on this in, 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 about statistics in the 19th century. When ideas about the norm or normal behavior come through and are validated through statistics or, or big data, it suddenly becomes the citizen's duty to, to live up to that kind of requirement. So, you know, we, you, you know I'm, I go to the doctor and, I, and he tells me, oh, Mr. Ohari, you're, you're, you're drinking too much. And I obviously reply, no, doctor, I'm not drinking enough, uh, I, I don't think. And he says, no, 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 your, 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 your life expectancy is only 71, and we want the, the average is 79, and you're pulling the rest of the country down with your so it's 14, 14 units a week, please. Okay. Um, and, and it's very difficult to get, get out of that sort of area, particularly when uh, something's as powerful as the government. Um, and this kind of, these kind of power relations between the citizen, the consumer, the data subject, and whoever's doing their big data stuff are quite um, pervasive. So uh, I'll kind of, I'm sort of wrapping up now, but uh, one week ago, uh, quite happily, uh, Google uh, came out with seven princ ethical principles of AI. This is the first one. And it's be socially beneficial. That's the first one. It used to be don't do evil, now, it, now, it's, now it's be socially beneficial. But then you think, well, Who's defining beneficial? Well, it's Google defining beneficial, thank you very much, I imagine. Uh, but isn't it interesting how that's purely a consequentialist view of the world? Right? That's not, there's no question about what's right or wrong. Right is just understood as socially beneficial. And it's socially beneficial, right? The benefits are to society, they're statistical they're in terms of probabilities. The consumer, the data subject, the citizen, doesn't seem to fit into this picture at all. Um, and that's why I'm kind of worried about this human dignity shaped whole. The other six principles are these, and they are kind of mother motherhood and apple pie, you know, uphold high standards of scientific excellence. I mean, who is going to argue for uphold poor standards of, of scientific uh, nonsense? Um, you know, th these are all kind of 
perfectly reasonable ethical principles, and I have no quarrel with them, except there's an awful lot of power in the definition. So all these emboldened words require some kind of implementation. That, so someone has to decide what an unfair bias is, whether a bias is fair or unfair. Someone makes that classification, and they have quite a lot of power with relation to, in relation to Proposition 2. Built and tested for safety. Someone's got to define what the harms are, so we can then define what safe behaviour is. Similarly, accountability. You know, is Google really accountable to me? What's the procedure that's in place for me to hold Google to account? And so on and so on and so on. All those bold words um, turn out to be little bottlenecks where, where power can be exercised. So just to, to wrap up, uh, one of my favorite uh, works of philosophy is Tocqueville's Democracy in America. Uh, stunningly good work. Near the end, he goes on this riff about a society where, which is remarkably Facebooky, and um, it's 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 very interesting because it's full of. He, he's he's anticipating a world in which our social uh, relations are breaking down and being related, being um, being regulated by this kind of rationalist, data-driven kind of relationship. And he imagines a world which is just designed for us and designed around us. Right? So it's very much this kind of personalized world that's dreamed up by, by uh, companies such as Google and by people who are in favor of digital by default government and that kind of thing. And he goes over the three or four pages about this immense and protective power. Uh, and, it, and this is the key of it, that the power works readily for the happiness of the people. So it's not against the people, it's not trying to do people harm. It works readily for their happiness, but it wishes to be the only provider and the only judge of happiness. So it defines its own conditions for success, and the human disappears from the loop. Uh, whoops, my final slide, human dignity. This, this kind of sums it up quite nicely. This, this, this is not what uh, uh, Kant was thinking of when he, he, he did his, uh, worked out his categorical imperative. If, if people are to be ends in themselves, you're not you're going to be happy. You shouldn't be happy for, on someone else's uh, uh, say so. You should decide yourself when you're happy and when you're satisfied with what's going on. And I think that's, that's the hole that's missing in this kind of statistical, probabilistic driven picture. Uh, of a data-driven world uh, with big data, machine learning, AI, and so on. So that says, please don't sue me if I've stolen your, your image. Uh, and thank you very much. <laughs>